The Marvel vs. Capcom franchise stands as a pinnacle in the realm of crossover series within video game history. These remarkable titles enabled players to pit characters from diverse universes against each other, defying all prior expectations of such encounters. Notably, some entries in this beloved series are revered as some of the finest fighting games ever crafted, with them being lauded for their extensive character rosters, innovative combinations of fighters, tag team mechanics, and signature frenetic gameplay. By now, undoubtedly, the Marvel vs. Capcom series has attained legendary status. However, despite its seemingly invincible trajectory, this iconic franchise has suffered a steep decline, which raises the question, what led to such an embarrassing monumental downfall? The answer could lie with one word, Disney. The same entity renowned for purchasing and then driving various beloved properties into the ground found itself entangled in the demise of this Capcom Classic 2. So today let's look at how it all went so horribly wrong. I am Lady Decade and this is the demise of Marvel vs Capcom Infinite, a shameful tale of destruction. I don't know about you, but with the amount of thoughts I have going around my head at once, I am constantly losing things. But thanks to Extra inventing the first trackable wallet, misplacing mine is much less of a headache than it used to be. Extra's super slim wallets boast half the size of traditional wallets, while having the ability to accommodate over 12 cards and cash, fitting in your pockets rather nicely. Its quick card access feature, which allows for easy retrieval with a click of a button, using its signature trigger mechanism, which I find oddly satisfying to use. Additionally, the built-in RFID protection safeguards me against data theft and wireless skimming. It's worth noting that my Parliament wallet here is crafted from a certified premium leather. First of all, the solar-powered tracking device enables you to locate your wallet via your phone, offering two-way ringing and separation alerts. What makes this all the sweeter is that with just two hours of sunlight, I can enjoy three months of charge. Extra is currently having an anniversary sale and has an incredible 20% off products. But with my delightful code, you lucky sods get 25% off instead. So click the link in the description, use code LADYDECADE and grab a wallet, bag or accessory that will help you to get more out of every day. If you don't want to lose your wallet, don't lose this deal. Marvel vs. Capcom truly boasts an impressive legacy. It all began in 1994 when gamers were astounded by the inclusion of Akuma in X-Men Children of the Atom. Witnessing a Street Fighter character in an X-Men game was a delightful surprise for the gaming community, so Capcom took note of the overwhelmingly positive response, leading to the creation of X-Men vs. Street Fighter in 1996. Yet another huge joy for fans. This groundbreaking title introduced numerous mechanics and conventions that would define the series' popularity, from aerial combat to tag team dynamics and the incorporation of larger-than-life moves. It was a spectacle of epic proportions. Seeing seemingly impossible matchups come to fruition was nothing short of exhilarating. The success of this game led to the creation of several sequels, with the series arguably reaching a zenith with Marvel vs. Capcom 2. This installment boasted a staggering roster of 56 characters and refined the tag team system to accommodate 3-on-3 three -three matches. The game was so good that it was hailed as the most ambitious crossover game of its time. It's nothing short of a masterpiece. After Marvel vs. Capcom 2, the popularity of fighting games waned, leading development studios like Capcom to significantly reduce their output in this genre. However, nine years later, following the resurgence sparked by Street Fighter 4, Marvel vs. Capcom 3 made its debut in 2011. This installment holds significance as the first release in the series following Disney's acquisition of Marvel. Although well received initially and still enjoyed by players today, there was a period during which Disney prevented gamers from even downloading this popular game. Disney's dubious decision stemmed from their desire to retain exclusivity over Marvel characters for their own games published by Disney Interactive Studios, leading to the discontinuation of the Marvel vs. Capcom license. This move coincided with the introduction of Disney Infinity, an action-adventure sandbox game that bore similarities to Skylanders. 
Disney Infinity capitalized on a physical toy sales, offering open world creation, story driven gameplay, and additional features accessible only through the purchase of their relatively expensive plastic figurines. However, this business model wasn't unique to Disney, as evidenced by Nintendo's similar approach to their amiibo range. Despite initial success, the market became saturated with similar products from major corporate brands within a short time frame. Consequently, by 2016, the Disney Infinity series met the same fate as Marvel vs. Capcom, facing cancellation due to the declining craze for such toys to life games. Oh Disney, how we hate you so. Disney's foray into game development proved less lucrative than anticipated, prompting a realization that game development wasn't their forte at the time. Consequently, they reverted to their traditional approach of outsourcing licenses to experienced developers and publishers who possessed the, the necessary expertise. Who would have ever imagined that game development would be best handled by game developers? The more you know. Despite the company's various missteps so far, Disney's setback ultimately led to an exciting development for Marvel vs. Capcom fans worldwide. At a Sony PlayStation Experience press conference, it was announced that Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3 would once again be available in digital stores. Furthermore, Disney granted Capcom the licensing rights to develop a brand new game, Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite, slated for release in 2017. So with this announcement, Marvel vs. Capcom was officially returning. The new project was entrusted to Norio Hirose, who had been a part of the series as a programmer since X-Men vs. Street Fighter in 1996. The development of this title involved collaboration among several entities, including Capcom of Japan, Capcom USA, and Marvel Games. Their goal was to create a game that struck a balance between complexity and accessibility. They aimed to maintain the depth and challenge characteristic of traditional fighting games, while also streaming the experience to appeal to a broader audience, a common trend in modern fighters. It's worth noting that previous titles like Street Fighter 4 and Marvel vs. Capcom 3 had already veered towards simplification compared to their predecessors. Games like the Street Fighter 3 series exemplified greater complexity, but struggled commercially. These types of games initially struggled to attract a wide audience upon release, as they failed to engage casual gamers sufficiently. However, Capcom addressed this issue with later titles by offering more simplified experiences, resulting in stronger sales. It's no wonder then that Capcom aimed to streamline their approach further. Adding to the excitement for Capcom, the Marvel brand was experiencing unprecedented growth, thanks in part to Disney's efforts. The success of the Marvel Cinematic Universe expanded the appeal of Marvel characters, creating an even larger casual market than before. In contrast to its position in 1996 and the release of X-Men vs Street Fighter, superheroes had become mainstream and undeniably cool. So the quest was on to deliver an experience that had even more mainstream appeal than previous Marvel vs Capcom games, so let's look at how they would try to achieve this. Mark Evans, a producer on the project, revealed that Capcom's analysis indicated many players found the previous entry in the series overwhelming, with too much happening at once. In an effort to make Marvel vs Capcom Infinite more accessible, the iconic 3-on-3 three -three battle system would be replaced with a simpler 2-on-2 two -two format. This decision, although Though aimed at widening the game's appeal, was met with disappointment from many fans, who saw it as a regression for the series. The removal of this six-person tag action was particularly disheartening for longtime fans, as the series had been praised for its inclusion of increasingly diverse elements. The three-on-three -three tag battles were a defining feature of Marvel vs. Capcom 2, contributing to its beloved status. Moreover, the series' trademark chaotic nature had set it apart from other fighting games. The decision to streamline the gameplay not only risked diluting the franchise's uniqueness, but also left fans feeling short-changed by the removal of features rather than their addition. This change understandably frustrated many players. In the quest for streamlining, Capcom made further adjustments beyond reducing the number of fighters per match. One notable change was the removal of the ability to call in other characters for assist moves, a feature well known in the series. Instead, this mechanic was replaced with a new feature centered around the use of six Infinity Stones. The implementation of the Infinity Stones can be likened to the grooves in Capcom vs SNK games, offering players slightly different fighting game mechanics. 
However, unlike the grooves, which aim to provide customization options, the Infinity Stones seems primarily intended to level the playing field in matches. Some argue that this move may have compromised the competitive nature of the game, potentially favouring less skilled players by introducing more possibilities for victory. The primary function of the Infinity Stones is to serve as a comeback mechanic, compensating for a player's deficiencies by enhancing their strengths. While the choice of the name Infinite for the title likely had some marketing considerations, the Infinity Stones themselves have further reinforced this theme. According to the developer, the goal was to present players with a limitless gameplay possibilities through the stones. Thankfully, Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite retains the Hyper Combo Gauge feature from previous entries, which gradually fills as characters deal and receive damage. This gauge enables players to execute traditional Hyper Combos, but now introduces a new move called a Counter Switch. Counter Switches allow players to instantly tag out even while under attack, simplifying combo breaks and providing easier counter attack opportunities. In a surprising move considering the aim to simplify gameplay, Capcom opted to revert to the old 4 attack button layout, reminiscent of earlier entries in the series. This decision may have been one of the aspects Capcom alluded to when they mentioned their intention to incorporate elements from older Marvel vs Capcom games into Infinite. To be honest, these changes don't significantly impact the game's accessibility, which appears to be Capcom's primary focus. Combos are now executed simply by tapping the light punch button, both on the ground and in the air, making them theoretically achievable even for a three-year-old. Even hyper combos can be activated by pressing the two heavy attack buttons simultaneously. However, the removal of specific joystick and button combinations does eliminate a layer of skill from the game, much to the dismay of many longtime fans. So, while we've covered the basic mechanical alterations, Marvel vs. Capcom's popularity in the past has stemmed from more than just its combat system. Despite the arguable simplification of the fighting mechanics, does this game at least offer an innovative and charming roster? Let's explore. Historically, each entry in the series introduced unique elements to the roster. The first game allowed players to control both X-Men and Street Fighter characters, while the second expanded to include other Marvel fighters. Subsequent entries introduced new characters on the Capcom side, culminating in the fourth installment's expansive roster. The fifth game continued this trend with a large, diverse roster featuring many new fighters. Each installment brought something fresh and new to the table. So, did Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite follow suit and offer an infinite array of fighters to choose from? <coughs> Clearly it did not. Marvel vs. Capcom 2 boasted a roster of 56 fighters, while Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom offered 48. However, Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite disappointed gamers with a launch lineup of only 30 characters, a significant regression. This reduction in character choices aligned with Capcom's aim to simplify the game, indicating that limiting player options was one of their strategies for achieving this goal. The disappointment was compounded by the fact that out of the 30 characters, only 5 were new additions to the franchise, with the rest being returning characters. On the Capcom side, newcomers included X from the Mega Man X series and Jeddah from Darkstalkers. Among Marvel characters, a newcomers consisted of Gamora from Guardians of the Galaxy, Ultron from the Avengers series, and Captain Marvel. Beyond simplification, I personally believe that Capcom deliberately restricted the roster to incentivize players to purchase additional DLC characters, six of whom I believe should have been included in the base game from day one. Marvel vs. Capcom is known for its extensive rosters and chaotic gameplay, so altering this aspect was unnecessary. Regarding the DLC, Black Panther, Black Widow, The Winter Soldier, Sigma, Monster Hunter and Venom were available for download. Notably, Venom had been a free character in previous games, adding to the frustration of having to pay extra for content that was previously included. What compounded this frustration was the absence of many beloved fighters from the series. Most notably, the majority of characters from the Street Fighter franchise were omitted. Even more alarming was the complete absence of any characters from the X-Men, a key focus of the crossover for the past two decades. 
Reportedly, Marvel Studios played a significant role in determining the game's character roster. Rather than prioritising superheroes with established lasting appeal, they focused on characters deemed important to their cinematic universe, which was heavily promoted at the time. Essentially, Disney chose characters for product placement purposes rather than aiming to create the most beloved roster possible. Truly horrible choices made by horrible people. Many fans were appalled by the absence of X-Men characters in the game considering that the success of previous crossover games had been built around them. There was a strong desire among fans to see their favourite X-Men return. It was baffling to many why such iconic characters would be omitted altogether from perhaps the best Marvel vs Capcom lineup. The absence of the X-Men lineup can be attributed to Disney's greed. Despite Disney's ownership of Marvel Studios, the movie rights to the X-Men franchise were held by Fox in 2016. There seems to be no legitimate reason why the entire X-Men roster had to be excluded from the game other than Disney's decision to discard them due to their inability to promote one of their own movies. This omission of the X-Men instantly made the title feel out of sync with the rest of the series. In a comical attempt to justify this corporate decision, Capcom producer Peter Rosas, also known as a combo fiend, offered an excuse for the absence of the X-Men from the game, stating, We talked with Marvel very closely about their future roadmap, about what's gonna be happening. Your modern Marvel fan, maybe they don't even remember some of the X-Men characters, but they know some of the Guardians characters or Black Panther. You know what I mean? Captain Marvel may seem like a strange pick, but... She's fantastic. She fits the gameplay. She fits the story and they're going to be really pushing her as a strong female lead all the way up into the movie. We're trying to take everything into account and choose the best characters. According to one of the key figures involved in the project, there was a belief that people were no longer familiar with the X-Men and would soon favour Disney's portrayal of Captain Marvel instead. On that note, feel free to share your preference down below. Do you prefer Capcom's depiction of the X-Men or Disney's Captain Marvel? I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Interestingly, Rosas further reinforces his opinion by suggesting that X-Men characters in previous Marvel vs Capcom entries were only popular due to their utility in the game rather than the iconic appeal of their character designs which many casual players enjoy. To be exact, he would state, If you were to actually think about it, these characters are just functions. They're just doing things. Magneto, case in point, is a favourite because he has 8-way dash and he's really fast, right? So our more technical players, all they want to do is a triangle jump and that kind of stuff. Well, guess what? Nova can do the same thing. Captain Marvel can do the same thing. Ultron can do the same thing. Go ahead and try them out. Peter... Oh, Peter, can you believe it? People actually enjoy playing fighting games for reasons beyond mastering every combo in existence. While the tournament scene and competitive play are important to some, the majority of players just want to enjoy the game with their favourite fighters, especially when it's filled with Marvel characters. Overall, I find Rosas' attempts at justification quite amusing, particularly regarding the absence of X-Men in the game. I understand that it might not look good for him or Capcom to admit that the X-Men were excluded simply because Disney didn't have a movie featuring them in the works. However, trying to argue that they're unpopular and nobody really wants to play as them is just plain ridiculous. It's a disappointing situation all around. Something worth noting though is that past this corporate sucking up, Peter Rosas went to work for Marvel Entertainment's game branch Marvel Games, working as a producer of Insomniac Games, a Spider-Man video game. In 2023, he worked as a senior manager in product development on Spider-Man 2, so make of that what you will. But back on the topic of this disastrous game, we got scaled back fighting mechanics and a meagre roster missing some of the most beloved Marvel characters, but perhaps the game's play mode can somewhat salvage it, so let's discuss those. Around the time of its release, Capcom was no stranger to criticism, having stumbled with their fighting games in the past. Street Fighter V, for instance, received harsh backlash due to its lack of content upon release, and server issues plagued the online multiplayer experience in its early days. With these criticisms in mind, Capcom aimed to improve on features like these with Marvel vs Capcom Infinite, hoping to rectify some of their past missteps. This meant that Infinite would include many standard fighting gameplay modes, addressing a shortfall that Street Fighter V had somehow managed to have. 
Additionally, this game would introduce a brand new play mode aimed at catering to diverse audiences and casual players who were enjoying the ever-expanding Marvel Cinematic Universe. In fact, I haven't touched on this yet, but you've likely noticed it throughout this discussion, the game's new cinematic graphical style. Unlike its predecessor Marvel vs Capcom 3, which featured characters resembling 3D models inspired by Marvel comic books, Infinite opts for a more realistic look, aligning closely with the aesthetic of the lucrative movie franchise. Capcom's intention was clearly to appeal to fans of these films, and this is where the new play mode, known as Infinite Story Mode, comes into play. This mode offers a two-hour cinematic story campaign, complete with story cutscenes and dialogue. These cheesy storyline attempts to tie all the characters from the game into one cohesive narrative, reminiscent of the subspace emissary mode featured in Super Smash Bros. Brawl a decade prior. While the story may deliver cringe-worthy one-liners lacking in charm, it at least introduces something new to the franchise if we're searching for any silver linings here. Reviewing multiple critiques published around the game's release, the average scores reveal a blend of both praise and criticism. Journalists expressed disappointment over many of the faults we've already discussed. However, certain elements did receive positive reception, such as the Infinity Stone system. As previously discussed, Capcom aimed to create a game with simplified mechanics to attract the vast audience of Marvel movie enthusiasts. Unfortunately, they fell short of this goal as the game significantly underperformed commercially, even alienating many established fans of the Marvel vs. Capcom series. Capcom had high hopes for the game, expecting to sell a minimum of 2 million units and potentially more if executed correctly. However, the game failed to come close to reaching this sales target Market, only managing to sell around 1 million copies. Considering the immense popularity of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, this sales figure was quite disappointing. In Capcom's 2018 integrated report, they described the sales of Infinite as weak, stating, Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite delivered a certain level of sales, primarily overseas, owing to a deep-rooted popularity, but underperformed overall. Considering the commercial shortcomings of this game, it seems highly improbable that there will ever be another Marvel vs. Capcom installment. However, when assigning blame for the demise of this franchise, is Disney solely responsible for its downfall? Personally, I believe both parties share equal responsibility, as both failed to deliver an experience worthy of the Marvel vs. Capcom brand. Disney should indeed be held accountable for denying longtime fans of the opportunity to play as the X-Men. The X-Men, along with the cast of Street Fighter, are the very foundation of this crossover formula. Therefore, excluding them from the game is utterly nonsensical, even if Disney had no plans to release X-Men movies at the time. The blatant corporate greed behind the Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite roster is painfully apparent. Speaking of greed, it appears to be the prevailing theme that ultimately thwarted any chance of this game attaining greatness. Capcom deliberately dismantled most of the intricacies, six-man action and chaos that defined the franchise's popularity. They discarded much of what fans cherished and were accustomed to, all in a misguided attempt to cater to a broader market that would ultimately overlook the game's existence. Their greed left them satisfying no one. While Disney certainly played a role in the device of Marvel vs. Capcom, Capcom itself seemed equally complicit in the affair. Despite the fall from grace of this once great franchise, all hope is not lost, as we still have the series' great games to revisit. These are games from a time when Capcom prioritised delivering the best possible experience, rather than chasing non-existent markets or exploiting consumers through microtransactions. If you enjoyed this content and crave more like it, don't forget to subscribe and check out my previous upload on the legendary X-Men vs. Street Fighter.